All right, everyone. How is everyone tonight? I need more energy. It's a Tuesday. How's everyone doing? OK, good. All right, for those who don't know me, my name's Carlos Tercios, and I'm the Program Associate for Diversity and Inclusion. I work right downstairs in the Mosaic Center, along with uh, the Mosaic Ambassadors and Interns. Do you guys mind raising your hand? We're a great team, a lot more vocal than <laughs> right now. But I just wanted to welcome all of you to our second PAW Talk. Uh, for those who don't know our new PAW Talk series and didn't come to our first PAW Talk featuring Angie Rivera in September, it is really for all of you to bridge connections with whoever the speaker is and for the speaker to share their story with you all and hopefully make an emotional connection. Um, I've, I know our team has really tried getting various speakers from all around the country and I'm so excited that, you know, now that we're going on to the second semester of this uh, Paw Talk, I'm so excited to see what programming we'll have in store for the spring. Um, before we begin, I encourage all of you to check out our front table by the time that you leave, uh, before you leave, and to check out our next upcoming event, which is Who is Puerto Rico? Uh, a deeper look into the 50, 51st state. It's moved to Commons 331. It was originally scheduled in the Mosaic Center. But it's this Thursday, and we'll be looking into the history of uh, Puerto Rico and its ties to the United States. Um, I also want to give a big thank you to the Gender and Women's Studies Department for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I know that we couldn't have done it without them. And now I just want to proceed to the event. It's my honor to introduce our speaker for this evening, Amal Kassir. Amal Kassir is a daughter of, of an American mother and a Syrian father, was raised in Denver, Denver, but lived for many years in Syria. While living in Syria, she came to understand the suffering of the people there, especially rural farmers and children. While the freedom she has always, from while the freedom she has living in the United States has allowed her to become an activist on their behalf. <clears throat> Amal is a talented spoken word artist that has performed in eight countries in over 50 cities from youth pri prisons to orphanages, <clears throat> sorry, orphanages uh, to refugee camps. Her work in the community involves humanitarian initiatives for Syria, speaking out and organizing against Islamophobia and empowering the voice of the marginalized through writing and speaking. She organizes demonstrations, vigils, fundraisers, and other educational events in Colorado, and has spoken on several Colorado news outlets. I would also like to include a trigger warning, a possible trigger warning, as some of the poetry may include graphic depictions. If any of you feel uncomfortable, please feel free to leave and come back at the end for our Q&A section. Uh, one last point as we go into that. Um, feel free if you need to leave for an evening class, but we ask that before you leave that you fill out our evaluation. It's really the way that we could gauge the room and see how you like the programming, how we can do a better job, and also tell us what a good job we're doing. Um, at the end, we're free to take pictures with the backdrop if you like, uh, and if Amal's okay with that, we could take pictures together with Amal. Um, and also there are cards on each of your tables. So if you have questions, there will be a Q&A section after she performs. Um, and you can submit your questions anonymously to one of the ambassadors or interns that will be running around throughout the evening's event. So with that, I would like to introduce them all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon all of you. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I missed my flight this morning. What do you know? Um, but we arrived right on time. My name means hope. And when I stand up here today, um, I think like for college students, because I just graduated last December, you know, I'm not going to do it so official. I ain't your grandma. You know, you can laugh, you can snap, you can be like, yo, that's not cool. And I don't know, I think, I think the world's got a really, really tense, overwhelming atmosphere right now. And uh, I think that 
the most productive dialogue we can have at this point is to, just to be real. And I'm going to be as real as I possibly can with you all. Um, no question is offensive except for a question that doesn't actually want to be answered. That's my motto. <laughs> so please, get comfortable. Um, I know that in the email, um, we had mentioned like kind of separating the talk and the poetry. But if it's cool, I'm just going to go through it. Yeah, I just do my thing. Um, so I know the theme is sort of Islamophobia, but you know, I'm going to begin with honoring my grandma, my mama, all of the different women out there, um, especially in the context of war, poverty, revolution, and struggle. Uh, and this is my favorite poem to perform, really. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My grandmother always had dinner on the table. Even when the tyrant put checkpoints outside her door, her defiance made mealtimes a battle her family would always win. As long as she could keep chopping, she would get that tabbouleh to the table fresh because families sit together to eat. They don't await the funeral prayer, so she would send my cousins down the stairs to get her parsley, and they ate like kings amidst a war zone. Recipes the tyrant has never tasted. My grandmother knows Syria better than anyone. It is the arthritis living in her knees. She had a farm whose dust she knew by name. She knew the day the peaches would be ripe and how sour a lemon was based on the rain. My grandmother spoke the language of the land that fed her. She housed families on her farm that would help till the soil. Their hands colored with dirt, her hands bruised from hollowing out all that zucchini. And they built Surya with a prayer, with a meal, blistered hands, and enough food to feed the neighbors. You see, the falah, the farmer, is the one who knows his country best. It is him to take the first bullets, and it is him to stay behind. He knows what Syria needs when she is thirsty, knows what she will do to his body when he is buried. A farmer knows what his grave will smell like. And when the war started, even the rivers ran away. For the hands of a militant are not like the hands of a farmer. Bullet and earth cannot speak to each other, and blood will never, ever make the crops grow. And so Syria stopped growing. She spent her time counting dead bodies. And it's hard to trust the footsteps when everyone is running, when the bombs disguise themselves as clouds, when militants, talk dirty about a country whose parsley they have never even tasted. Only a farmer will convince this soil to grow again. He is water in time of drought. His street dialect is the language this dirt prays in. And when he's cooking for all those starving people, he's using my grandmother's recipe. They cut down every single tree in my grandmother's farm. They rip the pomegranate from the earth, and the lemons do not grow there anymore. And the Syrian people wonder, does the tyrant not remember who fed him? My grandmother has sworn to write down every single recipe when this war is over because she knows what Syria needs. We know what all of our countries need. We will rebuild them with a prayer, with a meal, blistered hands, and enough food to feed each and every one of the neighbors. And the tyrants, and the militants, and the warlords, and the terrorists, and the rapists, just like the rest of us, they're going to learn their graves. They're going to feel the weight of the entire country on their chests. And when the soil asks them, did you not spill blood in my name? Then why do you fear me so? 
Let the earth give your body back to me, president. And Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, he's not going to know how to respond. He doesn't speak the language of his country. He will struggle against the dirt that fed him. Thank you. Give one extra warm round of applause for the farmers, the people who make your food. For the mothers, the people who make you. <laughs> and the earth, where our flesh is birthed from. Yeah. There's a reason I start off with that poem. Um, number one, my moral code was discovered and explored through the metaphors of this planet. In, in, in Arabi, there's the word baraka, like blessing. Something that has been bestowed on you, something that you did not necessarily earn, but something that has been provided in such bountiful, bountiful quantities and qualities. And the reality is this planet is a baraka. We do not own it. We own nothing of it. It's been... <sighs> I was born and raised in this country. I am American before I am Syrian. But I got my vocabulary from this country, but my fatherland is back home. My mama, she's from Iowa. My body is born of two types of blood. German and Syrian. Rhine River and Nehr al Furat, I am split tongue. Salt, bald, ein, rein on one side, makshnel on the other. Mama fed me meatloaf with a side of fatouche. She wrapped peanut butter and jelly beside. Some days it was salt and pepper, others it was cardamom, caraway, cumin, and coriander. My world was the most colorful spice rack. Growing up, Mama would read us nursery rhymes and then Quranic verses. Tell us stories of the founding fathers and then the Palmyra queens. And this woman, with an entirely different recipe book on her tongue, would trade her secrets across the oceans with my grandmother. Two women with opposites. One had hair colored like corn, green eyes, the softest tongue, couldn't pronounce the asabi that was my baba's language. And my grandmother, she didn't know a single European recipe. Her plump fingers perfected, yabra, Arab chested and hazel eyed. Fourteen children made her an expert in motherhood. When mama and tete spoke, they would use the braille of their palms to ask our foreheads if we were sick. They could tell how much we ate just by looking at us. And these women with the entirely different recipes in their blood, have the same identical libraries on their fingertips. You see, I'm like the international Silk Road. Bones of Damascus steel sized to a German skeleton. I got the skin of the Rocky Mountain Silk. Lisani, ma bihtaj warning before switching from one lugha to another. My tongue can go from Colorado weather to set by sunsets to Frankfurt after rainfall. When I was born, I didn't have no national anthem to my lips. I didn't know Tahiyat al-Alam. I didn't know the Star Spangled Banner. When I was born, the only language I spoke was whatever came out of the Holy Scripture from my mama's hands. And seven years after my birth, when I met my Arab grandmother the first time, it's like I was always already speaking the language of her flesh. Because I told you. I'm like rivers, split tongue, salt, dalt, hein, hein on one side, makshnel on the others. Hey! <laughs> Who here is from like not just, who's here is not Native American? Native American. <laughs> Who here is not 100% Native American? Come on now. Let's be real here. We all come from somewhere, right? In fact, our president 
his grandfather, I believe, came from Germany, which is where my mama's great-grandfather came from. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> um, how's the political reality on this campus? That's a good question. Is it kind of shaky? Because <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get some campuses where, like, open mics, you better be ready to get offended. And then there, <laughs> and then there are other ones where you don't necessarily have the talks, at least not with the people who need to be hearing it, you know? Would you say this is a diverse campus? Yes, we pride ourselves on that. Good, good, very nice. I pride myself on my diversity too. But one thing, as a Muslim, as a Muslim woman, that I pride myself more than anything is that our difference mean absolutely nothing when it is time for us to line up in prayer. I'm going to tell you guys a story about the Denver International Airport protest. January 28th, there was what we call the Muslim ban. Let's face it. You can call it with whatever you, whatever vocabulary word, non-political, appropriate thing you want. The reality is this was a Muslim ban. Grandma couldn't come here to get the medical attention she needed. People from all over the countries that need security most, the door shut on them. And I'm sure you saw the pictures, the videos, JFK, O'Hare International, LAX, all over this country, there were thousands and thousands of people lining up at the international terminal, demanding, demanding that we open up our doors. Denver, Colorado, let me tell you. <laughs> First off, I am half white, just a disclaimer. And according to the government documents, Arabs don't have their own little checkbox. You're white. Right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird place to be in. You know? I like to be treated like it sometimes. But, and I, I'll admit, I do got my privileges there, no doubt about it. But Denver is a very white area. <laughs> very, very, very much so. There's a dominant population. And I'm not saying like super racist, crazy stuff that you see in like rural Ohio or anything. That's just the predominant skin color. Right? And that's important in the story because there was a large lesson that was taught in race, in creed, in political stance on the day of January 28th, 2017, just a few weeks, less than two weeks after our president was sworn in. Denver, Colorado is not quite as active as New York. New York, you have people like Lyndall Sarsour. You have the Arab community there that's popping in there at any moment that you need them to be there. You know? <laughs> you know what's up. Like, you don't got to worry. If something goes down, you got at least 2,000 people behind you to be there at the time and the place when it is required. Now, Denver, it wasn't like that necessarily. At Denver, there came a point when me, my friend Ari and Chelsea, he's an Afghan-American Muslim, his wife, my best friend, she is a French-Mexican Muslim convert. Talk about diversity, right? We're sitting there on that day having no idea what the heck we were going to do. There's no one who's about to put a nice, big, huge protest up at DIA International. No one's going to take the initiative for us. We didn't have what, what Chicago had. We didn't have what JFK had. We didn't have what these large, large communities had. This is a much smaller community, much more quiet. So me in Denver, I've had a few, you know, experiences with the media. I had a following. Spoken word gets you there sometimes. And we decided that we were going to just show up at the airport. We didn't have a permit. We didn't know what the heck the plan was, right? I just put one Facebook status saying, be there, Denver International, 5 o'clock. Within minutes, we had press releases being documented. New York Times, Wash Post. We had some major, major media sources that were coming up and supporting us. Again, 
it's kind of scary when you got more media than you know if you got people. Five o'clock came around. We're on our way, 4.30. Dude, dua. All my Muslim people there, I straight up never made dua so hard in my life. <laughs> we, we made this prayer to God. Right? I am a God-believing woman. I know that is so anti-progressive modern-day culture, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, we had written on our skin, in permanent marker, the number of the lawyer. We had one sign with the First Amendment written on it, and we prayed, Oh Allah, if we are going to be used for anything, let us be used for victory and for strength of our people. Let us be defenders. That's, you know, that's aligning your intention, right? So we get there. It's like 4.50. We don't see anybody. And then all of a sudden, straight up, 1,000 people showed up in the middle of Denver International Terminal out of nowhere. The majority were white. We had maybe like 20 Muslims from different countries. Yeah, not a lot. But it was popping and no one was expecting it. First thing <laughs> I will tell you, Denver Police Department, they were ready for Black Panthers, right? They were ready for anarchists. They were ready for riots and violence and anger. They were not ready for a five foot two Muslim girl with a megaphone. I can assure you that much. And I say this with so much pride because I did not bring a megaphone with me. Some random person, I don't know who handed that megaphone to me. I dressed in red, Ari in white, Chelsea in blue. And we were going to be more American than we had ever been in our lives that night. So I had this megaphone, everyone had roses. We weren't allowed to put up our signs, so we put down our signs. And instead, every time a group of people walked out, we said the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, New York Times had 2.5 million people tuned in on their Facebook Live. And all of a sudden, the police officer, the police chief, Chief Lopez, said, you are not allowed to use your First Amendment right here. Oh, I was like, OK, one second. And I said it on the megaphone. And dude, the response was profound. People came there to defend something they thought was good. And when they said this, in front of 2.5 million people online, in front of 1,000 people before them, people were not happy. Because all of a sudden, what came as an anti-Muslim ban approach became having to defend our First Amendment right. If they arrested me, there were people chained up to my arms who were ready to go down to. We all got threatened. There was not one single arrest. There were zero acts of violence. There was, this was, this was civil unrest at its finest. We had no permit. But the most important part of this night, I think, the little Muslim white girl who had the megaphone. When it was time to pray Maghrib, which is the prayer when the sun goes down, a man typically leads the prayer. So I put the megaphone down, and the darkest skinned person we had just happened to be the one to stand up in the very front row. And then you had the next line. You had one man who was carrying a baby. You had another man who was maybe in his 90s. You had black, white, Afghan, you had immigrant, you had born in America, you had it all. In the next line, you had women of all colors, all shades of hijab. And we began the prayer. Now, right before we began the prayer, Officer Lopez came up to us along with a group of other police officers, and they were going to stop it. Here's the thing. Once you say, Allahu Akbar, you're in prayer now. <laughs> that's that. Allahu Akbar, and then we do this, and then that's it. We're in prayer. We have to finish our prayer before we get out of our prayer. Now, right before Officer Lopez came to stop the imam, the imam is the one who's leading the prayer at the very, very front. A thousand white people, predominantly, 
started screaming, let them pray, let them pray, let them pray, let them pray, until you had this huge chant happening, and they encircled us. We were, again, we were like, what, 20, 30 Muslims maybe, who were getting ready to pray. They had a chapel, but it would have been too small, and upstairs, and in private, but we, this was a demonstration in addition to our act of worship. We were encircled with people demanding that we had the right to pray, and then, and then the Imam, his name is Jafar, said, Allahu Akbar. That was not an easy prayer to concentrate in. <laughs> I will tell you that much. But everyone was watching us. Every single person was watching us. And something that is very, very special about the Islamic prayer is sujood. Now, sujood, I don't know if any of the brothers want to demonstrate. <laughs> sujood is when you are on the floor. One, two, three, four, five, both knees and your toes. You have seven parts of your body on the floor. Who's going to do a demonstration, brothers? <laughs> Come on. We need a demonstrator. We just need to show you. And I, I'll tell you, takbir. <laughs> this is the closest a Muslim can be to God. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, brother. We appreciate it. <laughs> to do that. Now imagine a thousand people and a bunch of cops with dogs and you're in the middle of an airport. You're on the floor. This is where Muslims talk to God. This is where like you're having your marriage trouble. You need an A on that exam. You're in the middle of a war zone. That's what you do. That's the position you get in. It is the most humble position that a human being can be in without being humiliated. Right? Without being able to be stepped on, you're still on your knees, you're still, you still have that stance, you can still get right back up. But your back is open. That's the opportunity where someone who wants to hurt you has their opportunity to hurt you. That's where you can get a baseball bat, that's where you can get a gun, that's where you can start kicking, that's where you can start shoving and spitting, and they have no power over you. The worshiper is in worship. You had all of us down on the floor. We had, you know, some had like newspapers to pray on and, and you know, you're supposed, it's supposed to be clean ideally. Um, and our backs to the world and anyone could do anything. And for us, we're in the closest, we are the closest to God that a Muslim can be to. And when we said our salamu alaykums, which is the official end of the prayer, and we all started getting up, if you guys ever see Tarzan, remember when he killed the leopard? And he like lift the leopard up and then all the monkeys started like cheering for him. All the gorillas were loud and it was like this celebration. Well, we got up and not just the people who were encircling us, but the people above, the police officers, the people who were working at McDonald's and Taco Bell, everyone burst into this insane applause. I'd never heard anything like it. Only after we finished though. I don't think Denver International Airport had ever been as quiet as it had been when we were on the floor. And again, it wasn't easy to concentrate. You knew exactly what was happening above you, but you knew exactly what you were doing. The comments I got that night from a variety of people was one, I have never felt so American in my life. And two, I have never felt so Muslim in my entire life. That is where I learned wholeheartedly that to practice who you are, that is the most American you can be in this country. Yeah, we can historically look and <laughs> there's a lot of uh, critiques that can be made about our history without a doubt. But that's what makes this country what it is. You're not allowed to define it for anybody but the one defining it for themselves. That's why our forefathers came here. That's why in the 1920s you had a bunch of Syrians and Lebanese people standing there and in Chicago and in Michigan settling and, and getting married and bringing their families from overseas. 
America became a place where you had the opportunity to make with what you will. And to give that up, to give your right to practice your religion, there is nothing more un-American than that. And I say this as a Muslim American woman, drop the Arab, drop the hyphen. That night, I don't know, I don't know what the politics in this room are, but <laughs> that night, I think the people who pushed for this ban and all the rhetoric surrounding it, I think they were scared of us. JFK, DIA, LAX, Dallas, all of these cities, since 9-11, no Muslim in this country would have imagined that we would be praying in the middle of the terminal, in groups not to mention. No one would have imagined that. Everyone here probably remembers September 11th. Yeah, is that fair to say? Whether they were here in this country or not. I was six years old. We had two bomb threats at our private Islamic school back in Denver. And honestly, my parents didn't tell me right away that that was the case. I came home, I saw these burning buildings, and I went upstairs and watched Lizzie McGuire for the rest of the day. We didn't know. But now the literature calls us the 9-11 generation. Every Muslim in this room, that's what the literature calls us. There's a reason for that. Paranoia increased, fear increased, um, mosque raids, I'm sure this, the East Coast probably had it a lot worse than we did. But I mean, you had riot police walking into the mosques with their shoes on, dumping over bookshelves with the Quran on it. Um, informants, you know, the FBI to this day still, you know, takes my dad out for dinner once in a while just to check up, you know. It was normal, but it was very scary at first because living life in America, that wasn't what the experience was. You know, you had, if you get, got called a raghead every once in a while, people would tell you to go back to your country. But after 9-11, I mean, something dramatically different happened. Now, according to some major studies, Pew Research Center, the ISPSU, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, um, they conducted research to see what the Islamic sentiment was after 9-11. Right after the buildings fell, on that horrid, horrid day in this country's memory. The one that took the lives of over 3,000 Americans. The first impulse of the American people, Muslim and non-Muslim, everyone. It didn't go to anti-Muslim sentiment. That was not the first reaction. We didn't blame anyone because we hadn't seen anything like this since Pearl Harbor and this was arguably worse. This was in the middle of a civilian area on a poppin' afternoon. But those sentiments started as soon as politicians started hitting the cameras. That's when the numbers go up. <laughs> and that's very normal. It's very normal. Politically speaking, people don't know who to hate necessarily until they're told who to hate. Hatred is not in, in, our, in, our, in our nature, at least not as heavily as, I don't know, 68% of Americans say they would never want to be near a Muslim, according to one popular research. That's not normal. That has to be aided, right? And I'm not sitting here saying a bunch of brown guys who said Allahu Akbar didn't do it. I'm not here saying that there aren't guys who yell Allahu Akbar and then blow themselves up in popular places. Absolutely not. We hate those guys too. But there's a lot more behind it. It's not as simple. How foolish would it be to blame a religion for something so political? How foolish would it be to say that this religion that we probably didn't even hear about until then is this most violent suicide bombing, whatever. Come on, dude, they didn't have bombs 1,400 years ago. There's a lot of psychology that goes into this. There's a lot of
the Muslim community as a whole has a lot of divisions within it. But nothing unifies us more than a terrorist attack in the eyes of others, but also in the eyes of ourselves. Now, do you guys remember that first poem I read you about the farm? My grandmother's farm. Remember how I told you they cut down all the lemons and all the pomegranates? You know what that farm is now? That farm is an orphanage. The lettuce has grown this season. The tomatoes have grown. The lentils are growing. You want to talk about counterterrorism? There you have it. We are confused right now, and I think that as a Muslim woman, critiquing the, the overall state of, of being Muslim in America, there's, there's two responses you're going to typically get. And this is from the mainstream. I'm not talking about activists. I'm not talking about the scholars. One, be as Muslim and anti-other as you possibly can be. CIA, Israel, Wahhabi, blah, 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 blah. You're going to use all those vocabulary words. And two, be as quiet as you can possibly be. Make that identity disappear. That's typically what the commonplace people will do. I can't remember the exact date, and if anyone does, uh, please let me know. But Chapel Hill, I think it was 2015 in February. A boy named Dia, his wife Yusur, and her little sister Razan were inside of their apartment building in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, when a white man, an atheist, a lone wolf, <laughs> walked into their home and shot them all execution style. Now, he'd called her a raghead before, told them to go back to their country before. But the frame of the media was that it was a parking dispute when they had plenty of encounters. And his Facebook had so much anti-religious sentiment on it that, again, it would be foolish to look past it. That murder was something particularly painful, I think, for a lot of young Muslims. One, Dia and Yusr hadn't even had a chance to see their wedding photos yet. They had just gotten married. Razan had just graduated high school. Dia and Yusr were in dental school together. They used to do dental care for the homeless on the streets of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. They were good kids. They were the kids we had in our community. They were the kids that looked like us. And they were killed. And it was shaking. I remember reading that. We didn't know. We didn't, we didn't know how to respond to this. For anyone else, it's just like, it's just another killing. This happens all the time, and it really does. But for us, the only thing that made it different between them, those who were killed, and between us was the fact that they lived in Chapel Hill. They didn't live in Denver. They didn't live in Dallas. They didn't live in some other rural city in the United States. There was nothing about them that put a target over their head. And then this last Ramadan, Nabra, Rahimullah Aleha. Two white men on a night during Ramadan, which is the holiest month of the Muslim calendar, um, attacked this young woman who was 17 years old. She was with a group of her friends, and her friends got away, and she was left behind. You can't imagine the weight on those young Muslims' hearts and minds. Autopsy report says she was bludgeoned, she was beaten, she was sodomized with a variety of foreign objects. She was raped over and over and over again. This girl's body was found in a river or something, I think. And it was disgusting and it was dirty. And every community has the right to mourn their people. That much is sure. We should mourn everyone, there's no doubt. But every community has the right to feel the pain of this. And that was difficult. I did not read the autopsy report, yo, until like last month. 
and this is one of us, and it's happening more frequently. And girls are taking off their hijabs more frequently. And we're afraid. Anytime something like that happens, my mom and my dad call me. Again, this isn't a sob story, yo. I'm American and I'm white. I'm fine. Nabra, she was a black girl. So there's more to her identity. But our parents are scared. And if you look at the psychology, this is developmentally damaging on us. And honestly, especially for our women, our Muslim women, who are already at the forefront of everyone's debate. I think they should wear it. I don't think they should wear it. I think it's oppressive. They're dealing with that on one hand, rapists on the other, and a society that is so afraid of them when their reputation is oppression anyway. It's twisted. Any of my Muslim ladies in here had a rape threat before? I have. 10 o'clock at night during Ramadan, a car of four boys. And they weren't all white. I got to mention that much. But it's common. I don't believe in self-pity. But I do believe in mourning. I don't believe in, like, poor Muslims, poor Muslims. No, you know what? We know we're different in a lot of different situations. We know we are strangers. We pray five times a day. The what we wear is different. What we eat is different. We don't drink. We don't do drugs, you know. And we're, some of us are struggling with certain things. Not every woman covers. Not every, we, you know, there's, there's, there's a different experience for the Muslims. But, but the Islamic tradition, it's the most obscure thing right now. There's nothing like it, and if there is, you're gonna go to the mountaintops in Nepal and talk to the monks. When it's time to pray, you better go pray. When the sun hits that other limit, you just missed prayer. That's a weight on our conscience. It's a profound experience being here, but if anyone does know the history of Islam in America, more than 33% of people brought here as slaves were Muslim. Those are our ancestors, too. They say, single-handedly, straight up, all the scholars in the world who studied Islam as a global phenomenon will attribute the greatest, most influential person to bring knowledge and awareness to Islam, Malcolm X. Our brother, too. <laughs> They're dealing with what's happening back home in our father's countries, what's happening here within our own communities with the misogyny that we're dealing with, which we wish it was only the Muslims, right? It's complex. I especially think being a woman, not to mention a black woman, a Muslim woman, an ethnic woman in the United States, that's something. And power to our ladies. For me, when I chose to wear hijab, I was 11 years old. And I walked into an airport. I was in a private Islamic school, right? It was Friday, so we used to wear the scarf. And we had Jum'ah prayer, the Friday gathering prayer. Um, and we were dropping my brother off at the airport. And I was like, all right, I'm going to wear it. I'm going to go into the airport, and I'm going to wear it. And my mom was like, dude, just shut up. <laughs> You're making a big deal out of nothing. You know, I remember when I walked into the airport, I was blown away at how these adults were like looking at me. Everyone's eyes were on me. And I was like, this is awesome. There's so much attention. And I'm just an 11 year old girl with pigtails underneath this thing. And it was one of those ugly two piece scarves, like the prepubescent hijabs, as we call them. Super gross. But you know, you, this is graduation here, this is much nicer. I assure you. Um, and I chose to wear hijab ever since then. 
Because for me, I, I, I enjoyed, it wasn't for religious reasons at the time. For now, trust me, if, my, if, if I didn't believe as a Muslim woman that God asked me to cover, trust me, no Muslim woman would wear it. If we didn't have to wear it, we wouldn't wear it, yo. Modesty, all that stuff, nah, that's extra stuff. Every woman has a reason. But because we Muslims believe that God asked them to, that's why we wear it, khalas. For me, what pushed me to do it was the defiance that came with it. My mama wore this. My community leaders wore this. I thought it was awesome. And I kept wearing it since then. And I think that's the only part of my identity that sort of maintained itself throughout. And I'm telling you, it's known even with the Muslims. Your faith. Faith is fundamental in any religion. It goes up and down and up and down. And there were low, 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 low points where praying was so difficult. Where, where knowledge was so distant, but I always had my hijab, and I never, ever, ever, ever wanted to be identified as anything but a Muslim woman. And that was just me. Mama and Daddy didn't teach me that. They didn't make me wear the scarf. Some girls get forced, yeah, there's no doubt. Some girls are forbidden from wearing it, there's no doubt. And now this pride, I think, has aided me to get to know my religion much, much better. Bet y'all didn't think you were in here for a religion talk. Ha ha! But, <laughs> um, but it's true. If you're gonna if you're gonna explore what Islamophobia is, I don't even like that word. You're gonna have to explore what Islam is, dude. We're not a concept. We're not a textbook vocab word. We're not something you Google in your search engine. There's a human experience involved with this. There is depression. There is struggle. I mean tell you a story. On April 4th, 2017, my dad woke me and my brother up for Salat al-Fajr, the sunrise prayer. You got to get that prayer right when the sun rises. You, you know, the cutoff time is when the sun has officially risen off the horizon, right? Um, so it's much earlier now with this time change. But Baba woke me and Usama up. My little brother's name is Usama, yes. <laughs> um, and he told us that his sister's home has been hit with a bomb in Syria. Now, usually you see anger in my father when there's an attack or something. Um, but this time around, there was fear. And I remember WhatsApp, if you all have WhatsApp on your cell phones, that's based, every single Arab person and their mom has WhatsApp. That's where we, that's, that's our Twitter, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's where we were getting the updates, you know? And originally, they pulled one of my cousins out dead. Then they pulled my dad's sister out, but she was alive. And the words, alhamdulillah, that word means praise be to God. The word, alhamdulillah, escaped our lips. Like, like, yeah, we lost someone, but my father's sister, my father's sister, everyone here who has siblings understands what this relationship is. She made it. And then just a minute after that relief, we got the message, ishtashhadit Basima. Basima, which is her name has been martyred. She, she died. She died after they pulled her out of the rubble. By the end of the day, 11 members of my family had been killed, and I'm including the two unborn babies inside of the pregnant women. 11 people. How this ties into faith? Well, a couple months ago, one of the only survivors of that attack, who was my aunt's husband, he lost three of his daughters, he lost his wife, he lost his mother, he lost his sister, he lost two grandchildren, unborn grandchild, and then a sister. And my father asked him, like, how's it going? And the words that escaped his lips were, alhamdulillah, praise be to God, alhamdulillah, praise be to God. God didn't pick me to go with him. And he kept saying this over and over, my dad said. He said, he kept saying that he wasn't picked to go with them. He wasn't picked to go with them. That experience of faith is fundamentally different than our experiences here. Maybe what the father and mother of Nabra, the girl who was bludgeoned, raped, and killed on the night of Ramadan, or Dia, Yusir, and Razan, their fathers and mothers, maybe they could relate. But that is an experience where you are left alone with absolutely nothing.
my faith was explored through the wars back home. I believe in hell because of what those men are doing. And I believe in heaven because of what those people have survived. You cannot take God away from a person in a war zone. We're privileged, we don't need it here. I do, <laughs> oh my God, you have no idea how much I need it sometimes. <laughs> the idea of something external, maybe it's crazy, maybe it's fair to land according to a lot of people, but in instances like that, the science, the science shows that religion coupled with faith, not any of that weird ISIS stuff, I don't know what that is. All I know is Fox News and ISIS agree exactly on what Islam is, but the rest of the Muslims don't. That's all I know. Faith and community, that is the thing that will save a child and any person in a war zone. That is a fact. Research it. Look it up. These are the things that will preserve people. When we look at terrorism, I think we're studying it wrong. I think that's intentional, possibly. But typically, they are lone wolves. Weird associating that skin color to that, that word, right? But typically, if you're going to get terrorists in Western countries, typically, typically, they are lone wolves, typically. I'm sure there's exceptions. For me, I try to focus on this a little bit, the psychology, right? They're typically people who don't go to the masjids. That's not to say they're bad people originally. Not everyone who goes to the masjid is a good person, and not everyone who doesn't is a bad person. But typically, the people who are most vulnerable to these types of things don't have a strong community. They have very limited knowledge in religion and faith. And there's some type of psychological situation happening. They say that the greatest, the places with highest violence are typically the places with the most poverty. I've done some studies in the United States. Not personally, but I've read them. To mistrust the very institutions that are meant to take care of you That is such a risk factor for anger and therefore violence. And not necessarily violence in the form of terrorist attacks. That type of stuff is crazy. I'm talking violence against yourselves. I'm talking about just having a gun. I'm talking about drive-bys. Talking about, you name it. I don't know, walking into a church and shooting people up. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And I think our understanding of religion has been so misconstrued that the very topic itself is difficult to talk about. And so when you further it with this violence and this terrorism and everything, it's not a religion of people anymore. It's this concept. It says in the Quran, to take one life is to take all of mankind. To save one life is to save all of mankind. Someone ain't reading those verses. If you open up the Constitution and you don't read the whole thing through, your summary is, OK, so everyone has guns, and there's slavery here, and it doesn't say anything anywhere where women can vote. Weird. That's what you're going to get about America, and that's not what America is. Be weary of the logical fallacies that come with trying to interpret cultures and identities and religions. And as far as Islam, there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. Only 20% come out of the Middle East. And Indonesia has the largest population. It's so situational. But I bring so many aspects of, of, of life and war and all of these things because I think it's important to remember that, again, this is not concepts we are dealing with. These are human realities.
and the greatest thing that will damage a child and put him at risk for terrorism and violence? Well, look at Syria. Being beaten by European cops with batons at the ends of railroad tracks trying to make it to, to Europe for, to find a better life and all they've seen is angry white men with batons and all they've seen is the hunger and starvation and nobody helping them and all they understand is war and violence and they are orphans and, and I mean think of all of these components that would play into someone possibly going and joining some organization that promises them 40 virgins, heaven for eternity and revenge. That's the key thing, it's revenge. We're people, and I think to forget that human aspect, that's a very, 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 very damaging thing. Um, how are we on time? Marvelous. I don't know what time it actually is. Uh, it is 6.41 and we technically have 50 minutes. Marvelous. Marvelous. I can do a poem. And then Q&A would be awesome. Do you guys like me yammering? <laughs> There's so much to say sometimes. And like I said, I kind of go with the flow and see what's up um, community by community. Um, I have this poem for you all. It's called Dementia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm sick, by the way. I have to cough real quick. Give me a second. <coughs> it's that nice, nice, clean cough, too. Um, <laughs> My mama drank the Rocky Mountain snow while I was in her womb. My feet is birthmarked in U.S. landmarks. My spine jagged like the western slope. My America taught me what it means to carve grand canyons out of rivers. Taught me that even shallow waters can shape a country that here you get to spangle your scarves with stars. Write constitutions in Arabic, translate the Bill of Rights into every single language. America taught me that even shallow waters can shape a country. But when the river got infected with some bigotry and blood, she was swept up in this flash flood confusion. The stripes on her flag slipped off into a blindfold. Someone put bullet holes where her star should be. She would stop me, frisk me, like I was an American, like she had dementia, like she forgot she created me. Symptoms of dementia include disorientation. She thought she was painting the American flag in the blue, bruised, blood red of the Muslim corpse on the concrete. She never called it a hate crime. Symptoms of dementia include forgetfulness in the evening hours. A white hood is the same color as a dark man's skin when the sun goes down. Maybe that's why the KKK sets fires at night. Symptoms of dementia include inability to speak or understand. America stopped speaking with me. She said her anchor man could do it for me. How could she understand me? Symptoms of dementia include making things up. She said I was a terrorist, an extremist, a sand raghead said I am not American, like Denver General doesn't have my birth certificate, like my spine isn't an aspen tree, like I'm not made of the same roots as all my neighbors. My mom always taught me to pick things up when they fell apart. And as the branches of this family tree are collapsing, I am doing my best to hold it back together. Because if you pull one aspen tree from the ground, the whole forest will feel its roots sever. America got dementia. She doesn't remember the Rocky Mountain water my mama drank or the 14 or she put on my fingertips, but she said so herself. Even shallow waters can shape a country. I'm almost certain that's why she put these Colorado rivers in my blood. Hey! <laughs> is this awkward or is this cool? Yeah? It's good. Okay, cool. Awesome. Just checking, you know, just gotta see what your vibe is. Um, if you guys have questions, I think 
either say it out loud or write it on a piece of paper. Marvelous. All right. Hello. Nice to meet you. Ah, I am 22 years old. 22 years young, ideally. But all oh, the wars have aged me. <laughs> Just kidding. Appreciate you, sister. Samar, right? Beautiful. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Give it up for Samar. Man, she's beautiful. Ghana and Syrian dude? Oh my gosh, the best looking babies, I bet. <laughs> You know, there are times when I would go up to the mountains by myself. I would know I was isolated for sure. Oh, I'd take it off, no one's around, it's cool. Wind flowing through my hair, my brothers would take me, it'd be chill, you know? But I think the only time I have ever, ever slightly considered it was one time when I was in a gas station in a very, 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 very rural Ohio um, and it was actually a couple weeks ago. This was the first time in my life um, seriously considered it. There were Confederate flags hung up, and there was this guy in the truck in front of me who was getting some gas, and he just kept looking at me weird. And it's, it wasn't like I'm going to take off my scarf real quick. No way. It was the first time where I realized that my scarf and my safety can definitely, definitely conflict. Um, as far as, like, my... I think when I was like 12 or 13, I went through like an emo phase and you know, all I could do was like pull the black scarf like above my eyes a lot to like make it equivalent to the hair thing. But um, I'm not even kidding, dude. It was such bad pictures from that year. Um, but I think when I was much younger, it would cross my mind in regard to beauty, like wanting to be prettier. But alhamdulillah, I mean, I always had this pursuit of, of identity that was stronger, and I really prided myself on my ability to sort of stand up for, for myself um, and my people, I would, I would think it was. Um, so I never wanted to be identified as non-Muslim unless my life's in danger, in which case, just pull over a hoodie. They have actually a Muslim, like, emergency care packet thing where they'll suggest to you women will wear beanies, like after the San Bernardino thing, after Orlando. Um, yeah, but never actually show my hair. Just kind of covered that I'm, I'm Muslim. But I've never done it, alhamdulillah. And I'm very grateful for that. I would never blame a woman who chose to out of her safety. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next question is, <clears throat> instead of kind of going back, what empowered you to speak out against the the thing I mentioned, I didn't like the term Islamophobia because of the fact that um, it, it's, it's like, it's, we're not spiders, <laughs> we're not like snakes, although some people think we are. I, would call, I call it anti-Islamic bigotry. Um, my mom, I told you, she's a white woman. This story is my pride. This is how I look up to my mama. Um, she was walking in a, in a Walmart parking lot or something, and this dude in a stereotypical big red truck, a big white guy who was bald, screamed out his window, go home. 
My mama wasn't having it that day. So she saw where he parked, walked up to his window, knocked on it, and asked him. And this guy said, what the heck? And he like rolled down his window. This is her testimony. He rolled down his window, and he's like, yes? She's like, excuse me, sir, what did you say to me back there? And he's like, nothing. And she's like, that's what I thought, and walked right back inside of the grocery store. That's boss. Give it up for my mama. <laughs> I would not recommend that nowadays, dude, because everyone's got a gun, for sure. That's very dangerous. However, the women that I respect, who raised me, all wore it. My mom's a convert. She converted when she was 15 years old and then married my dad and had five kids. But her mama was real happy, right? <laughs> um, that was a funny cultural joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but she, uh, she had no fear, she changed her name. Her name is Melissa, Lisa Pizza was her nickname, but she goes by Iman, which means faith. And I think that that is a very, very, very fitting name for her. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I don't like when rude, horrible things happen. I don't like when people in power do bad things. I don't like liars. I hate liars. I don't like when people on television lie. And I know I sound like my auntie 13-year-old self right now, but straight up, that I don't like that. I don't care that someone wears the scarf or doesn't wear the scarf, but I will defend their right to do so. Alhamdulillah, we're lucky in the West. We have plenty of women to defend the women who take it off. We have plenty. And it's a little Western feminist extremist. It's not very friendly all the time. But you know, they're, they're, they've got their cover. And like I said, respect to any woman who identifies as Muslim. We all wear it when we pray. But I will stand up with my hijab and defend our right to be a Muslim without a question because it is our right to practice our religion. And there is nothing more American than that, like I said. Did that answer the question? What empowers me? Hopefully. <laughs> Miss Anonymous, Mr. Anonymous. Hi. Hi. I just want to say that I've been like halfway to tears this entire time, so you should know that. Thank you. And I'm also just going to take a moment to slightly say Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a weird weather. Like, there's no way to love that. Like, I'm yeah. not For sure. But my name is Mehed, and Beautiful. I'm hosting her to you guys, and I'll just keep you have my number for my dad's wife. <laughs> to a Muslim woman who's white wearing hijab. The number of times a drunk guy on the street has been like, wait, you're white, why are you wearing that thing on your head? Not even, at least three times in my life so far. Um, I'll admit, I'm gonna make a race comment for sure. I don't know if, that, if my skin color was different that I would be where I am today. I, I, I have no, I have no deny, I, I couldn't know that. This is what I am, I was born in the suburbs. I was born with a very light-skinned mother and a, I don't know what happened to the dominant gene with my dad, but it disappeared with my mom. Um, and I worked in upper class, my dad had a restaurant in like the white part of town. Like not just the white part of town, the let's make America great again and I'm gonna ask why you're wearing that hat at work and whether it's your uniform type of people, right? Um, so that was who I learned to talk to originally. And I think, it, I mean, it depends on who I'm speaking to because no matter what, there, I, I am a part of a minority because of my hijab, but I will not pretend like I don't have the privilege despite my hijab. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, if those very special, polite church groups that I go to would receive me the same way. I don't, and I'm, dude, I'm admitting it. I, I don't know. I don't have to deal with the race situation. That is not in my, in my struggle. And I don't know. Maybe it's like there's like an element of like welcomeness. Like, oh, she's out here. She's like us. Her mom's from Iowa. 
you know, and oh, she's not speaking weird in a weird accent, right? Um, it's hard to say. But I think, I, I mean, I'm making a comment as far as the media representation. The media likes light-skinned, skinny Muslim girls. That's who they're going to slap on Glamour magazine. That's who they're going to they're gonna like, you know? And inshallah, like, I don't know. I will step off the mic if someone, if someone will take it from me, you know? I, I have no doubt about what my privilege means, and I, don't, I couldn't know unless my audience has told me. And this might piss a lot of people off, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's true, you know. Um, I don't know, people typically, like, they're, like, cool with me, you know. You either see me as a person. If you see my face, you will see me. If you see this on my head, you're going to see nothing but the same controversy you'll see on the next girl. It doesn't matter. Um, at the airport, it's a little easier for me. I've traveled with like my black Muslim friends. Yeah, that's a different experience. Um, did that answer your question? Marvelous. Good. Does anyone else have questions? Hello. Yeah. Number one, if you don't have the courage to intervene when someone's getting bullied or someone's being harassed right in front of your eyes, you don't have the courage to get up on a mic. That's a fact. The greatest act of courage is when you don't have a thousand people. Um, honestly, public speaking is my advantage. I'm very well practiced in public speaking. I've been doing it for a lot of years, you know, since I was a kid. So, I mean, if you're ready to stand up on a mic, I believe this, I believe this 100%. You do not need confidence to get up on a mic. You do not need confidence in yourself. You need to have certainty in what you believe in. In the Islamic tradition, we don't have the concept of campaigning. We don't have, like, when, when there's a leader, it's typically, ideally, in an ideal setting, um, the leader is chosen by the people. The leader doesn't campaign and try to convince people to vote for them, right? And so we sort of have to view leadership from that lens as in it is a responsibility. It is not something to be admired for. It is something that puts you in a position where, one, you can oppress. Islamically, the rulings are if you are a leader over four people and you oppress them, you can be counted as a tyrant, as a dictator, the same level as the next you know, throne king or whatever. Um, I did not bring a megaphone, and I had no plan for that day. And I mean, that, that situation was, I had to do that. There was, Ari and Chelsea didn't want the microphone at that point. I had poems off the top of my tongue, and I don't know. But if you don't have certainty, you won't be able to keep going. You'll run out of things to say, and the first person that criticizes you or boos you is going to bring you down. So I think, you know, we have to start at the grassroots. There's a reason why the grassroots is so fundamental because, I mean, we showed you what sujood looks like. We are on the floor when we pray. And for others, they're getting their feet dirty. Their feet has to be with the community. You have to understand what's going on, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's whatever your cause is. Have certainty in what you believe in and be ready to stand up for it, whether it's on a train, whether it's, it's online, on Facebook status or whatever or whether there's a thousand people before you. These are our values. Morals are what's outside for the world to follow. Values are what's in here that make your backbone stand up. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so next we have a comment and a question. All right. You are unapologetically you. Thank you. I was an antsy little girl, <laughs> I really was. 
And uh, my privilege has 100% a lot to do with it, I think. Um, again, I, my father, we weren't grandfathered into money. Um, my father came here and he was mopping floors at a Chinese restaurant. Um, and then he, you know, came to Denver, started running donut shops until he was managing them and until he had enough to open up his own business. So my entire life has been funded off of the food that my dad feeds people. Um, and alhamdulillah, we're very, very grateful. It has been a blessed amount of money. Trust me, when, when, my, <laughs> when my dad is having struggle financially, Islamically, that's when you're supposed to donate. That's the greatest test of faith. Um, so we've never, we've never had to experience any type of poverty, any type of hunger. Um, so all I was exposed to as a young girl really were, were the issues of other people. You know, my parents did show me pictures of starving children. Um, the Bosnian genocide had happened shortly before I was born. Um, and, you know, my mother did not hesitate to show us about that, tell us about that, what was happening to the kids, what was happening to the people, you know, handing us money to go to the homeless person and give it to him and smile and tell him to have a good day. That's what we were taught. In our privilege, we were taught what it looks like to not have. Um, and we never really thought about our privilege necessarily until it became a topic um, in the greater world. And I realized that because I didn't have any other things to worry about, my parents enabled us to sort of not have knowledge in different branches of the, of the world and its needs to sort of understand what others are going through. Um, and I think that is why I always had this unapologetic feel because I had nothing to lose. I, I didn't have anything to lose. And I, and I, wanted, I want to note that you know, this, this suburban house that I was born in, it burned down. So we have experienced nothing in that sense. You know what I mean? Our American dream has burned down to the very, very bottom. And what happened three days after? My aunt's house in Syria got bombed. You know, so how, like, like you, we, we, alhamdulillah, because of our Islam, first off, our religion, I think that's why my parents taught me to be this way. Um, but also because we weren't dealing with hunger, because we weren't dealing with anything that compromised our psychosocial, physical health, um, we had the opportunity to have that sort of certainty in ourselves and be able to step up. There's a, there's a hadith, a saying by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it says that if you see something that must be changed, try to change it with your hands. Try to stop it with your physical efforts. If you can't do that, use your tongue. If you can't do that, use your heart. And that's where the prayer comes in, that's where the faith comes in. Um, so we were afforded the ability to use the first two resources. Um, and the situation in Syria led us to re require that last component. Um, but I guess my summary is we were privileged enough to have our parents raise us in that way, and we had nothing to distract us from the other world. Slackers. Yeah, I'm ready for you. It's the most difficult question, dear. I wish like you could have asked that question like three, four years ago. I would have had like democracy. We're gonna save the world. Blah blah blah. But now, dude, there's like what eight million refugees. Um, the whole country, the whole country is destroyed. The whole country is destroyed. Everything's destroyed. It's flattened. It's flattened. This country's been devastated. Remember when I told you guys I believe in a hell because of this war? I'm not just talking about the dictators. I'm talking about the men who sat in their nice leather chairs with their oak wooden tables and their sparkling waters in the United Nations and watched those atrocities happen. There have been chemical massacres that have completely destroyed lives. There have been the worst rapes, the worst killings, the detainings, the pictures. Like, dude, may Allah destroy the oppressor, all of them who let this happen. Um, the day after President Donald Trump dropped a missile on a Assad regime, military whatever, Stocks went up. 
the stock, like, like the company made so much money off of that attack. People were like, aren't you excited? Aren't you excited? Donald Trump's doing something against Essen. Like, are you kidding me? The dude just banned us like a week ago. <laughs> what do you mean? And like, I don't know. I don't know. I believe that they will be accountable one way or another. Essen needs to go. Essa needs to rot in prison for a long time. He needs to rot in prison. May he have the longest life, and may he sit in prison. Um, ISIS was given permission to form. I was in French class. I was 16 years old in high school. Wallahi, by God, I said, just watch. Some sort of Al-Qaeda thing is going to pop up if they don't do something. Wallahi, I said this. I was 16 years old, dude. I don't like calling it a proxy war because this began as a revolution. This began as a revolution. And it was stepped on and dirty hands were dipped into it and money and the black market and, and the refugee. Like, I have no idea what to do about Syria. All I know is that right now, when I lost my family members, we were in the sixth year and we were ready. We were ready to lose that number of our people. And Muslims believe, whether you are Muslim or whether you are non-Muslim, if you make a prayer against the oppressor, the oppressor will be held accountable. God listens to the prayer of the oppressed and that's that don't matter what religion, what faith you are. The people who are dying, there is heaven for them. I believe that, I believe that. Um, oh, by the way, Russia's only naval base on the Mediterranean is there in Syria, FYI. It is a huge, very marketable, strategic, geopolitical, economic place. Um, so if you study the history of this country, who had a 97% literacy rate before the war, you will see that this was permission granted. I don't know what's going to happen. I, once upon a time, I did. Revolution, freedom, we're going to get rid of the dictator, the Democratic um, Transition Council, which did exist. Christians, Jews, Derzis, Ismailis, everyone was on it. Um, I don't know. All I know is that the dictator will fall, because all dictators fall. And that's what I try to do to let me sleep at night. <laughs> I bet that was a very passionate answer to something you didn't expect. Um, if there is one way I believe that everyone here should help the Syrian people if they want to, invest in the schools and the refugee camps. You want to know what the recipe for a terrorist is? An orphan that's illiterate and has a lot of trauma. That's your recipe. That's the best way to get someone into a gun. If you want to donate, donate to community centers that in, in these different countries that are making sure these kids know how to read and are going to school. That is, the, that is their one chance in this disgusting, evil world. The world's a wonderful place, but whatever, whatever those dudes up there are doing to it, it is our responsibility from the grassroots, from all the way down here, to ensure that we take care of our people. And by our people, I mean the underdogs. I mean those who are hungry and those who are burdened because war is a rich man's game and they are sending our people into graves to fight it for them. Make sure you take care of the young people, the children, the elderly. They're going to die anyways, right? That's a sick and twisted way to put it. But uh, if these kids don't know how to read, we are giving them absolutely no future absolutely no future and forget it doesn't have to just be syria there's refugee camps everywhere in the world there is a huge population close your eyes pick one and your money's going to a good cause i promise i promise any other questions <laughs> hello Yeah. So I've noticed in the last, this was the Texas that attacked the church. And um, I've noticed in media, they love to define terrorism to 
<laughs> Hit me. Was a Muslim. Yeah. Oh yeah. Dude, yeah. I mean, dude, first off, like, just because he yells Allahu Akbar and says, like, Hezbollah, like, that doesn't mean, that doesn't legitimize him as a terrorist. Like, terrorist is a big word. You're letting, like, little random kids get known as terrorist? Like, gosh, have some, like, have some dignity in, in, in your homeland security. Like, come on. You're calling this little kid who just went on YouTube and like looked up ISIS a few times a terrorist? Yeah, the kid screwed up. He killed a bunch of people. But terrorist? Like, dude, that's a big word. That's a huge word, and I think we forget that. I think we really forget that. Um, remember Vegas? There is a moment before every main revelation in those main attacks. And I'm sure every Muslim in this room can agree where you're like, Ya Allah, please don't be Muslim. Don't be Muhammad. Don't be Abdurrahman. Don't be from Uzbekistan. Don't be from here, 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 here. Every single time. But it's like at this point, they're not even being shy about it. If it's white, it's a lone wolf. If it's brown, I mean, dude, I heard the term Black Panther once. I was like, what? Like, are you sure? Like, th there's, there's just, the, the, like, watch, about, watch out for the media. And dude, stay off Facebook after a main situation happens. It is profound what you will actually come to realize about these different views. Death is so political. It is so political. Um, but I think, I think all of us in this room can agree that the killer has to be brown for it to be called a terrorist. And if he's white, he's a lone wolf. Psychology, mental health, yeah. et cetera. And I'm, I'm not being dramatic. I'm not, I'm not being dramatic. Before, it was like every once in a while, it would be like, oh, OK. But now, they're not even being shy about it. Even CNN had to put up a, or BBC had to like put up a post apologizing at the fact that they said not related to terrorists as soon as they found out it was white when they thought he was brown originally. And then what? ISIS is like, oh yeah, he converted to Islam a week ago. This random Nevada dude. Like, it just, it's, just, it's just trigger words. It's just trigger words. And read the bottom marquees. You know, I remember Orlando. Do you remember when they found out that he was homosexual? and got AIDS from a Latino lover that he had, all of a sudden it wasn't a big deal in the news anymore. Weird, right? All of the loopholes were tied, and most people don't remember those loopholes being tied. We just kind of ended on the note that he, was, he yelled out. You know what he yelled out? He yelled out, I support Hezbollah and ISIS. They're fighting each other. Are you kidding me? Like, you don't even know what you're supporting, dummy. Like, if, if the transcripts are true, because they blotted out everything except for those like Arabic words. Allahu Akbar, Hezbollah, ISIS. Like, dude, it's, it's foolish. And um, remember, remember when I was talking about taking up the mic and the stage? Those are those instances where it really does count. Because a lot of people really genuinely, genuinely, genuinely believe Muslims are just a bunch of crazy, angry people who kill people. Y'all would be dead if that was the case. There's 1.8 billion of us. The word terrorism next to Islam was not introduced until 1983 after the bombing in Beirut of a US embassy. The word terrorist and Islam were never related to each other at any point until 1983. Before that, I mean, they just had the reputation of being like savage brown people, but all brown people had that reputation, right? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm a little blunt here. Um, but yeah, I don't remember who asked the question. Uh, yeah, if that, answered, if that addressed your statement.
You guys like that? I, I blabber. I'm so sorry if it doesn't make sense. I hope you're keeping up um, and not, yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, being, being black is fine. Peace. Jazakallah khair, brother. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> It really depends. Um, typically, and this is part of the 9-11 syndrome, I guess you could call it. Uh, I might be crazy, this might be weird, and I hope someone else in the room does it, but I'm prepared. I make up scenarios in my head. I watch plenty of Fox News videos just to sort of have dialogue with myself. You know, they say the best way to argue is to know your opponent's strategy of argument. Um, I've heard it all, really, uh, and, and a lot of situations, like when I'm at the airport, I'm ready. When I'm, the only time it really affects me in a way that I'm not ready is when it's completely unexpected. Like this one time, and I think this might be like, I can't remember a time other than it. I, I, don't, I don't like being powerless. I don't know if you can tell by it. <laughs> I do not like being powerless. And there was this one time when I walked off an airplane into Denver after a long travel situation and Oh my God, this killed me. It was so long. I was so glad to be home, you know, and as soon as I walked off, this white guy sung suspect right as I walked by and I stopped and I turned around and I looked at where the sound came from and I saw him lift his phone up and grab his kid. And I just stood there like, like, like I, I couldn't say anything. And I'd never been called a suspect before. That was difficult because one, the coward made sure that I was not going to say anything back. And I don't like that powerlessness. Um, one time when we were driving on the highway, me and my, my hijabi friend, <laughs> this guy was so silly. He, he screamed out his window. We weren't expecting it at first you know, go home or terrorist or something like that. One of, one of the common mottos that they learn off of YouTube or whatever. Um, and this guy was driving a company van. Oh, and he was on the highway in traffic. It was so funny because at first we were like, oh, oh. We pulled out our, youth, our Facebook Live and we're filming his number. Dude, they got like 500 calls that day. The lady had to call me and personally apologize. We told them to call and make sure that this guy is fired, right? So in that situation, it was very convenient. He had his uh, boss's number right on the side of the truck. That was, oh, dude, that guy lost his job so quick. And I mean, having Facebook Live, I have a lot of followers and uh, yeah, that was, that was a mission accomplished on the part of like <laughs> zero points for Islamophobia, one point for the muzzies. It was pretty cool. Um, but I think just being prepared has been how I, I can feel most comfortable reacting. Um, being unprepared, that's, that's just the worst feeling in the world. But usually you expect it. And more often than not, people are actually really nice. You get stared at a lot, but I think it's safe to say my hijabi ladies in here, my Muslim ladies, my black brothers and sisters, like you all know the stairs, you get used to it at a certain point, you don't even notice it anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know, it sucks to be powerless. So that's why I try to be prepared. Well, um, oh. One more question. One yeah. oh. um, how did you decide to go, to, well I guess it's a three part. Um, oh, ho, ho. How Wow, you sound like my dad. <laughs> um, what is your plan? I wish I knew. But for the first question, um, I will be the first one to admit this. I am, 
I'm good at what I'm doing right now. This is what I like to do. This is what I'm good at talking. Talking, uh, you know, those nice catchphrases that inspire writing poetry, getting messages out there. Um, and I don't like being called an activist. Yes, absolutely. I will get on the megaphone and I will make sure people are led in the right direction. And I have, alhamdulillah, I have that talent to do it. I have it. It's something I've, I've done for years. This is a craft and I've, I've practiced, right? Um, true activism is not that. True activism isn't on the microphone. It's not. And I don't like being called an activist because it's almost, it's almost hypocritical. Um, true activism is on the ground. It's on the grassroots. It's the organizers. It's the movers and the shakers. It's the producers, right? It's the people who are planning. It's the MSAs. It's the, it's the student activities. It's the organizers. It's the people who have a vision, who may get a team and make that thing happen. That's what true activism is. For me, my big mouth led me to where I am. That's what my daddy says. Um, I'm not afraid to speak up. I am afraid to ask someone to let me cut them in line if I'm about to miss my flight or to take back my food because I have bacon all over it. But I am not afraid to stand up and, and in those situations, you know. And alhamdulillah, if that's what's needed, you know, I, I tend to, the role kind of finds me. I don't necessarily pursue it. Um, for me, my activism, if I'm going to use that word, it's just knowing what's going on in the world. Um, that's the least we can do. That's the least anyone can do. And if that at least makes your mind active, if you have a good mind, if you know who's dying in the world today, that's good. That's very good. It's not nice when I meet someone who's just like, oh, what's Syria? I'm like, how? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be mean to you about it, but how don't you know? How don't you know yet, you know? And I mean, there's situations where it's understandable, but if you've got a television, you know. Um, I went to school at University of Colorado, Denver, and I designed my own degree. It's called Community Programming, Social Psychology. System ain't going to trap me in. Um, <laughs> and I really, really love it. I love programming, just being able to use research to develop programs based on getting to know people and their needs. You know, that's, that's what I do. Um, I am unemployed, besides doing poetry and stuff, and I'm going, um, I'm working on a book. Um, but I want to study, I've, dude, I've said this enough times, I know I'm on a list, but I want to study terrorism. I want to study terrorists. I want to see what, I want to understand their minds. I want to understand their networks and their goals and what the heck is actually going on. Um, believe it or not, there's not a lot of Muslims in the fields. And I can understand why, dude. It's like people, people kind of are like, what the heck? She wants to study terrorism? I'm not talking about how to be a terrorist by du like dummies book or whatever. I'm talking about actually going into the criminological, sociological aspects. Um, and modern day terrorism is completely different than, uh, I guess, than, than what we had before. Um, a lot of the terrorism studies nowadays is drawn from gangs, Crips and Bloods, and MS-13 or 17, I cannot remember. Um, but different, different gangs, it's, it's a network. It's, um, so I want to study that in grad school. Um, when I was 17, my YouTube video came out, and, they, <laughs> and two FBI agents came to my dad's restaurant and asked them about me. So they already know, don't worry, <laughs> I promise. Um, but I don't know what I want to do, but I want to help my people. And I want to help the people that are most, 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 most underserved. You know, there's a lot of people that the world won't believe in. And I'm not talking about terrorists right now. I'm talking about, like, I'm talking about the underdog. I'm talking about when this isn't in the same kind of health and this isn't in a good kind of health in your body and your mind. I'm, I, want, I want to be there for those who don't have anyone there for them. And I want to understand them and I want to make sure that we don't let kids pick up a gun thinking they're doing the right thing or blowing themselves up thinking they're doing the right thing. You think the Muslim community isn't saddened by that? Someone's son just blew himself up. Like that's, that's a whole kind of struggle like it would be great to avoid. Look up prevent in the United Nations, in the UK. 
That is the worst counterterrorism program I've ever read. Oh my God, it's like a factory farm for terrorism. It's so messed up. They're traumatizing so many kids. They have the right to take kids at like uh, up to like six years old without guardians, without any legal oversight into detention centers if they have a feeling that they might be radical. And this is the feeling. This is on the discretion of the teachers. It's so whack. That's a good way to traumatize a kid. Um, so work on that, you know. I don't like calling it counterterrorism because we all know exactly who I'm working with. <laughs> I'm talking about the Muslims too. But I want to understand this and contribute to the scholarship. That's just a dream, right? Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, can you please join me in a round of applause? Yay! Thank you guys. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Absolutely. Again, we'll be taking a few photos with the mall if you'd like to take one with her. Um, Selfie. And you can please leave your uh, evals at the table and uh, have a good night. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. I appreciate it. Can I leave one last rhyme? Yes. Oh, sure. cool. Yeah, just one, I promise. Yeah, okay. This is for my hijabis out there. It's that season again. I got split ends. My hair be looking crazy, cause I've been getting lazy. Won't tell you if it's short, or even if it's wavy. Only that it's time for a haircut for hijabi, just like a vigilante. No one really sees my hair, except all their aunties. But it's that season again, I gotta find a friend who will cut this mess, but gets how I dress, private room in the back, hook it up and charge me less. I got that Muslim girl struggle, got a shampoo on the double. If a boy walks in, man, you know that he's in trouble. I'm the fly. I don't need no cape up on my back. Despite my whacked out do, I am a hero in head rap. But still my point stands, I gotta snip these splitting strands. So if you got the haircut hookup, hit me up, fam. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you.